I really believe we're in it for a treat tonight. It was over uh, about 28 years ago. Tina and I, we were a very young couple. It was before we had children. I went out to visit my folks in the Pacific Northwest and did a little calling around to find out if there was a good church in our area. There was not, so we traveled into the Portland area. Uh, Beaver Creek, Oregon, it's a suburb, can be considered a suburb of Portland. And uh, somebody said, Mike Mutchler is pastor pastoring a church. And we found it. It was a grade school, an elementary school. And we went in, and we were treated like royalty. And uh, we said to ourselves, let's go back next time we go out there. And we did. But it seems like every time we returned, they were in a different building. And the church just expanded more and more and more. And it now, I, I haven't been out there, Brother Mutchler, in a couple of years, but I need to, I guess. Um, it's just an amazing church, and it's one of those churches. There's a lot of great churches, but this is one of those great, vibrant churches. It is alive. Let me give you some statistics here. First of all, they have a Korean church. They have a Spanish church, and, of course, the English-speaking church. Their Spanish church runs over 350. Uh, Grandview Ministries employs over 50 people. Approximately half of those are Hiles Anderson College graduates. They have seen over 100 teens go off to Bible colleges across the country. They've seen over 150,000 people saved. If you ever are in the Portland, Oregon area, you got to get out and see Grandview Baptist Church. It really is an amazing, thriving church. You will be blessed. Let's pay attention. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us get what Brother Mutchler is going to preach to us tonight. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm also honored to have my dear wife with me tonight, and I want to have Miss Vicki stand, if she will. There she is, and she is a blessing to a lot of people. Take your Bibles to John chapter 12, if you will. While you're turning there, let me just say I'm honored to be here, looking forward to uh, the opportunity to preach to you. It was in 1980 that I first came to Hammond. Uh, I was invited by a friend to go to a pastor school, and I said, well, why should I go to pastor school? I'm already a pastor. I'd started a church in Conway, Arkansas. We were about two years of age about the t at that time, probably running about 60 or 70 maybe. And I said, I'm already a pastor. He said, no, I want you ought to go to pastor school and hear Dr. Jack Hiles. And I said, well, who wants to go hear a medical doctor? Uh, he said, no, he's a pastor, but they call him doctor. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know some of them. Okay. Uh, so he is a pastor, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. And he said, I said, well, how big is this church? Does, does he run 500? And uh, at the time they said, no, he runs 12,000. I said, no, he doesn't do that. My city's that big. He said, no way. He said, yeah. He said, I got a tape by him. I, I don't want, let's play it. So he put it in. Uh, it was called Fresh Oil. And he puts it in, and uh, after about two minutes, I, I hit it, pop it out. And I said, he's got a bad cold, doesn't he? <laughs> he said, no, he's got a throat problem. Oh, okay. About two minutes later, I popped it out again. I said, that's a bad throat problem, isn't it? He said, yeah but it doesn't stop him, he keeps on preaching. I thought, oh, okay, well, that's good. I kept listening to it. Boy, about every few minutes, I'd pop it off. He'd say, what's the matter now? I said, I'm, I'm catching my breath. I said, I am so under conviction. I said, this guy's talking about the Holy Spirit like he knows him. I know about him, but this guy knows him. One time, uh, D.L. Moody was in an evangelistic crusade in London, and some men were, older pastors were gathering together and said, why do we need this Dr. Moody? Why do we need this Moody fellow? Moody, Moody, that's all I hear is Mr. Moody. He said, he doesn't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. And a wiser, younger pastor said, no, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. And that's what Dr. Hiles was. What an amazing time. I still remember in the old auditorium being there that first time, him preaching. Uh, it really just tore my heart out. 
for the cause of Christ, uh, to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. The thing that always impressed me about this great church is the compassion for people. The compassion for people. I'm so glad to see all these many years later you still have this compassion for people. What a wonderful thing that is to have as believers, to love people like Jesus loves people. If you found John chapter 12, would you mind standing with me if you're able to? If you're not, just remain seated there. But in John chapter 12, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. The Bible says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Then said he, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag, and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people, the Jews, therefore knew that he was there. And they came out for Jesus' sake only, uh, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. And let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. You may be seated afterwards. Father, in these next few minutes, speak to our hearts from your word and by your spirit. Lord, we yield ourselves to you. We want to be a blessing. We want to be a conduit through which you can flow. I thank you for these good people that came out tonight, dear Lord. I thank you for those who are in other programs on this property. I thank you for their services. I pray you'll bless and enrich their lives. Lord, I know on a Wednesday night, people have worked hard. It's been a busy week. They're tired. And I pray that having come out tonight, that it will be worth their while. Help us all to be able to say when we go from this place, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for loving us, Lord, and we love you. And we want you to know that. And we showed up for you, dear Lord, not to hear a man, but because we love you. And Father, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. This passage of scripture talks basically about two different individuals. We have Mary Magdalene who had the ointment and that is the larger body of this passage of scripture. But I want us to talk about Lazarus tonight. We see Lazarus was raised from the dead and the Bible says that uh, they had, had a supper and they invited people to come and many people came because they wanted to see Lazarus. I want to speak this evening on the subject of using our influence for Christ. Using our influence for Christ. All of us have a story. I so enjoyed hearing Adriana's story uh, about how she came to Christ and rode the church bus and went to uh, school and then to college and now teaching at the very school that she went to as a first grader. What an amazing story. But the truth is all of us have a story and we all have the capacity to use that story for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Lazarus of course had a pretty unique story. He was dead for four days and then he was raised triumphantly back to life. That is a pretty unique one. If I ever hear that in a church, I'm gonna write that down in the back of my Bible. That, that, that's a pretty unusual thing. And so here they're having a supper and uh, some people are saying, hey, uh, where are you going? Walking down the street, oh, I'm going to go to Lazarus' house. Uh, uh, he's having a party there, and, uh, and Jesus is there. Ah, oh, yeah, I've heard about Jesus. I, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm going to go. Well, yeah, but I said, is it Lazarus' house? Lazarus, La wait a minute. La no, no, he died, remember? He died, he was sick. And he died. What do you mean going to Lazarus? No, no, he's alive. He's what? He's alive. 
No, no, you're crazy. I was at the funeral. He was dead. I looked at the body. I went with them as they went weeping to the gravesite. I saw him placed in there. I saw the stone. He's dead. No, no, he's alive. You see, Jesus, four days later, said, roll away the stone. And they rolled away the stone. And Martha was protesting, Lord, he stinketh. He's dead four days. You don't want to roll away the stone. There were reasons they put all these spices on those dead bodies. They didn't have anything that sealed them very tight. And the odor of death, you didn't want to get around that. Oh, don't roll that stone back in. That'd be a mess. Roll away the stone. And then Jesus just stood there and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he's wrapped just like we wrap them in death. And he comes And Jesus looks at him and says, loose him and let him go. Really? And you saw that? Yeah, I saw that. Well, I saw him put him in there, but I didn't see him get out. Well, we're going to his house now. Okay, I got to see that. I got to see that. Here's a man who was dead for four days and then is alive. Who wouldn't want to see that? Amen. I want to I wanna check that out. Hey, but you know, that's very similar to the story that all of us have. Because the Bible says we were dead in trespasses and sins, right? And Jesus Christ made us alive. You who were dead in trespasses and sin hath he quickened, old English word, made alive. We've been made alive by the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got a testimony just like Lazarus. I was dead, but I was dead longer than four days. I was dead for a long time. Well, I got saved as a nine-year-old boy. That's longer than four. But I came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I became alive the very second I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And that's your testimony, too. And we ought to use that testimony for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to use that. Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Colossians 12, uh, 2, 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. He used his influence for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we ought to as well. In this passage of scripture, I want to point out three ways that Lazarus used his influence for the Lord Jesus Christ in those same three ways that you and I can use our influence. The first thing we see here is he got Jesus to a meeting place. He got Jesus to a meeting place. If you're going to introduce people to Jesus, you need to take them to a place where Jesus is. And there ought to be some places where Jesus is. For instance, this passage of Scripture, they made a supper and so the place where they had the meeting place was their home. Shouldn't your home reflect the Lord Jesus Christ? Shouldn't our homes be a place that people can come and say, Jesus lives here? Oh yeah, definitely so. I heard a story about a wealthy man who many years ago got this big elaborate painting of the Lord Jesus Christ and he was so impressed by it that he just purchased it and then he takes it back and he finds that there's no place to put it in his home that does justice to it. So he looks all over this big mansion of a house he has and he just cannot find any place to put it. So finally he breaks down and he calls the architecture who built the home and he gets the architecture out there and the architect and he comes and he has him take a tour of the home and finally the architect says, you know, you cannot place this in this home you have to build a home around this picture. And you know, Jesus doesn't want to come and just be a part of our home. He wants us to build our home around Him. And that's what we have to do, build our home around the Lord Jesus Christ. We shouldn't have just maybe, you know, one something on the wall, but our home ought to reflect 
the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. People ought to be able to come into our homes and see a Bible uh, laying around. They ought to come in our home and maybe have some Bible verses on the wall or uh, maybe some different things that show the Lord Jesus Christ, some different sayings. They ought to be able to walk around and see that this is a home that reflects the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a home where Jesus is welcome and where Jesus exists. The Bible says in verses 1 and 2, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So they got Jesus to a meeting place. Now you can do that. You can set some Bibles out. I don't know about you, but chances are your home has more than one Bible, right? You got the Bible you read, but you got other Bibles. I remember... Two years ago at a missions conference, we had a man who was born in Syria and got saved. And he told a story about how his father came back from uh, work one day and he came in the door and he said, I got saved. And everybody thought, well, you got what? He said in that Syrian language, to, be, to mean you got saved means that you were about to die and someone rescued you. And that's what it means. And he said, what do you mean? Were, were you mugged or were you attacked? Or, he said, no, no, I got saved. He said, I got born again. And none of the family understood any of the terminology he was using. And he said, I have trusted Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And the family was saying, oh no, dad, you're gonna get us all killed, don't do that. He said, that's how I felt. It's like, no. And dad came back and he had two Bible verses written on a little piece of paper. Two Bible verses. And he said, we had devotions every day for six months with those two Bible verses. He said in Syria, he said, where I grew up, when you talked about the Bible or said the Bible, most people thought that was a made up story because he didn't know anyone who ever seen a Bible, much less possessed a Bible. And they thought you were just making it up. He said, several months after we became Christians, eventually our whole family came to faith in Christ. We had been going to a gathering for about a year, and one of the members came in all excited and says, I got a Bible. I got a Bible. And they were so thrilled and we were all standing around looking at it like, there is one. It, and they touched it and it's a Bible. And the person who owned that Bible would loan it to the families for 48 hours. 48 hours. And so for those 48 hours, he said all of our family would take turns. We would get a piece of paper, we'd get a pen, and we'd start copying as fast as we could the Bible for 48 hours. So we take an hour turn and then we turn it over to someone else. They take an hour turn and we just copied and copied and copied. And then after 48 hours with tears in our eyes, we'd have to take that Bible and give it to the next family. And the only Bible we have is what we were able to copy in those 48 hours. Man, that spoke to my heart. And so that night I went home and I started thinking about how precious it is to have a Bible and then how many Bibles we would have. I went out in the garage and I got a cardboard box and I brought it in the living room and then I started going around the house picking up Bibles. I'd go to a little bookcase and I'd pull out all the Bibles there. I'd go into uh, our bedroom and I would pull the Bibles out that I had there and I'd go everywhere around the house and I came up with 37 Bibles out of one home. I don't mean a box of Bibles, just I mean Bibles we own. And so that next night I took those box there and I said he talked about having two Bible verses on a piece of paper. And I went in my home and I got this Bible and this Bible and this Bible and I put all 37 of them on the pulpit. I said, how many think that if we own this many Bibles, we ought to see that somebody else gets a Bible? And our people committed, and we committed to giving $500 a month to buy Bibles to get smuggled 
into Syria. I'm just saying it's a precious thing. Your home ought to reflect. Bibles ought to be around. Uh, Christian things ought to be around. Plaques ought to be around. Things about your church ought to be around. Gospel tracts ought to be around. We need our homes to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. So we ought to get Christ into our home so when we invite people, they can see Christ. And then, of course, we need to have Christ at our church. Now, I know growing in a place like this, you think, well, of course, pastor, Christ is in our church. Apparently, you haven't visited a lot of churches. Remember in Revelation chapter 3, God is speaking. He says, behold, I stand in the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Wait a minute, that passage is talking about Jesus knocking not on the heart of a Christian, he's talking, or an unsaved person, he's knocking on the door of the church and they won't let him in. How many think we ought to let Jesus in church? Amen? We ought to, it's all about him. He's the founder, he's the foundation. He's the reason we assemble. Praise God that somebody just sang a wonderful, powerful song. But we didn't come to hear the song. We came to hear Jesus. We came to love on Jesus. We came to experience the love of Jesus. We're here because of Jesus. That's why we've gathered. So praise God for everything else we have. But it's not about all the things we have. It's all about Jesus. We've got to have a church that reflects the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I grew up in church since I was eight years of age. I got saved at nine. I've been in church all my life, and I found that some people don't always act like Jesus at church. I hate to let that out. That probably surprises you already, don't you? You're thinking, no, really? Yeah. There's some people that don't always act like Christ at church. That's my seat. Somebody's sitting in my seat. I remember pastoring one time in Arkansas, and a man came by and said, I guess you don't need me anymore. I said, well, what's the matter? Someone's in my seat. And I thought to myself, I don't need you anymore. You're right. <laughs> That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for Christians who reflect Christ. People say, sure, sit here. Here's a good seat. Take this one. We're here to serve the Lord and to serve one another. And Jesus says, as we serve one another, we're actually serving Him when we serve other people. J.R. Caldwell said, I find that the greatest hindrance to the gospel and the greatest hindrances to many precious truths taking effect in the hearts and consciousness of unbelievers is the unchristlike lives of those who profess the truth. Oh, give me a hundred people that are making it the business of their lives to be like Christ, reading His Word and crying to God and to show them the right way, and I will show you a place where there will be permanent blessing. I'd rather meet with 20 people in a warehouse that want to serve God than 10,000 in a beautiful building that are going every which way. You know, if we'll just go in the same direction Christ is leading, God will bless and bless and bless and bless. We need Him in our churches. We need Him in our homes. The truth is, we need Him everywhere we go. Lazarus invited Jesus to where he was. It happened to be his house, but wherever we meet Jesus, wherever we are, that's where Jesus ought to be. Years ago in a seminary, a Dr. Temple was addressing a bunch of newly ordained young men. And he said, young men, believe me that you will make more people Christians by being Christian yourself than by all the sermons you will ever preach. You see, it's how we live that makes the difference. It was Gandhi, Gandhi who said, uh, I would be a Christian if it wasn't for Christians. Oh, that's a sad thing, isn't it? But sometimes we don't try to even reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. We, love, we want to give people our mind. We want to give them our opinion. We want to tell them what we think. When the reality is, what we think really doesn't matter. It's only what He thinks. 
We want to be Christ-like. We want church to be a place where Jesus is welcome and Jesus is preeminent. And you'll be surprised how people will want to come when we uphold the Lord Jesus Christ. First, they got Jesus to a place, but secondly, notice that they used their influence to get them to where Jesus was. So first they threw a party and they got Jesus to the place, but then they used their influence to start inviting people. Come, hey, come to our house. Jesus is here. Come to our place. Jesus is here. And so they used their influence to gather people to come together where Jesus was, whether that's in your home. Uh, I, I try my best to preach, I try my best to teach, I try my best to help people, but I believe that probably what has helped our church grow as much as anything is my wife's cooking. We'll bring four or five families over. Uh, we try to do it almost every week and we bring families over to our house and she cooks a wonderful meal and they get to see what a Christian home's like and they don't see a, a bunch of junk in the floors and they see order and they don't hear yelling and they see kindness and orderliness and, and they get to know my wife and I are, are very real people, especially my wife, she's very real and uh, funny and laughing and joking with them and and you know, we're just using what God's given us to point people to Jesus. Use your home. Use your home as a tool to introduce people to Jesus. Use your church. Well, that's why we carry gospel tracts, invite people to Christ, invite people to church. We ought to be doing that all the time. We got to invite people. There's a lot of people that don't go to church today, but I'm told that 25% of them say, if a friend invited me to church, I would go. Oh, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? That's one out of four that don't go to church. If a friend invited them to church, they would go. So er use every special day you have as an opportunity to invite someone. Oh, we're having a special speaker this Sunday. Hey, our pastor has a special service this Sunday. Oh, we're doing something special this Sunday. Invite them, invite them, invite them. People you work with, you say, oh, they don't care anything about church. Invite them anyway. 25% of them will come. Use what we have to get people to Jesus, using our influence. It's interesting that some come because they believe Jesus is there. Now, there's people who visit our churches, and, and they come because of Jesus. They believe in Jesus. They've already trusted Christ as their personal Savior. They're, they're looking for a church, and, and they come to check your church out. And usually, you can always tell the ones who came to check the church out because they're always like this. Now, I don't know how it is here, but in the Northwest, people don't want to tell you they're a visitor. You know they're a visitor. Oh, it's so good to have you today. What's your name? Bill. Uh, where do you live? Uh, around. How long have you lived here? Good while. They don't want to answer a question. They want, they want to just come in and just check you out for a good while. But you know how you know you got them. When you look at them, and they're like this. And then after a while, there's greeting time, and they start getting out and start shaking hands with people. Then you I got them. <laughs> hey, listen, we got to reach people for the Savior. We got to keep going after people. We got to use our homes. We got to use our churches. We got to use everything we have get, been given by the Lord Jesus Christ to influence others for the Lord Jesus Christ. I got saved when I was a nine year old boy. My father had a study on a Wednesday night and uh, I got under conviction because he told me if I didn't have Jesus in my heart, I wasn't gonna go to heaven, I was gonna go to hell. And I knew I didn't have Jesus in my heart, so I knew I was gonna go to hell. And so that night I asked my father, I said, Dad, uh, I wanna go to heaven when I die. He said, ask the pastor this Sunday. Well, that time my father didn't know how to explain the gospel. Since then, he became a wonderful soul winner, though he's been in heaven now for six years. But that Sunday, I remember walking that, uh, down that aisle, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. 
That's been a long time ago. I was nine years of age, I'm 61, and two more Sundays I'll be 62. Well, no, the, the first Sunday and in, in the first day of October I'll be 62. Hey, that's a good day to remember, just remember that. I want all my people to remember that, that's a good day. Good day in history, October 1st. Anyway, a few years ago I had an opportunity, I say a few years, it's probably been 10 now, I took all my family, my children, I took them back to Clarksville, Tennessee, where I was raised up. My father retired at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, so Clarksville we call home. Nobody lives there. We still call it home because we stayed four years of our lives there in Clarksville, Tennessee, and it's the most we ever spent in one place. My father was military, traveled around a lot. I wanted to show him the church I got saved at. It was just a little basement church. After I went to Bible college, my father and the church added a beautiful second story to it. I remember going to it a few times. And I wanted to go inside because I wanted to see the place that I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I tried all the doors. They were all locked. Nobody was there. We were getting in our car about to drive away, and then another car pulled in and parked. I got out of my car, went over there. He said, could I help you? I said, well, I'm just driving through with my family, but years ago, I got saved in that church. And I was just wondering if there's any way I could get in and look at it. He said, you know, I'm the youth pastor, or I should say I was the youth pastor. I just resigned a few weeks ago, and I have tomorrow's my last day, but I got a key still. Let me show you. He opened it up. I got my family out of the car. We went into the church. I looked at the new auditorium that I never much attended, but my father helped build. It was the same. Gold, <clears throat> gold carpet, gold pews. Remember what it was, Hiles Auditorium. Every church in the 70s had gold, gold, gold. You, you can date a church by what color it has. That's true. And uh, so I said, could we go in the basement? Went down the basement. And I went and I stood over the spot I trusted Christ as my personal Savior. I had a camera with me. <laughs> Didn't have a cell phone back there. We took pictures. And I had my camera and I, I took a picture of the linoleum. But it was on that spot. I invited Christ as my Savior as a nine-year-old boy. I remember every place it was built. We had a platform. I knelt right there. My pastor led me to Christ. I took that picture, and I was trying to explain to this youth pastor what took place here. And I said, this, I said, this, I said, that's the spot. That's where I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I looked at the young man. He didn't know me. I didn't know him. But I said, you know, since that day, some way, somehow, I've been used of God to see tens of thousands of people come to faith in Christ. I'm so thankful for that day. Aren't you thankful for the place you got saved? We have to use what we've been giving for the cause of Christ. Now, the third step is to realize that our influence can make an eternal difference. There was a famous evangelist. His name was uh, uh, L.R. Scarborough, uh, probably 50, 60 years ago. He was telling how he was preaching a series of sermons in a nice college and he was preaching a basic Bible doctrine. After it was all over, there was a young college student that came to him. And he said to him, he was a senior, he said, I've listened to your whole series of evangelistic sermons. I've heard you preach about the deity of Christ. I've heard you preach on the inspiration of Scripture, the efficacy of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. And he said, and I, I have the logic to refute every one of them. But last week, 
I stood by the gravesite of my little mother's godly body as they lowered her in the ground. And he said, sir, I can argue against your logic, but I have no answer for a godly life like my mother. And I want the faith she had. And in just in a few moments, he was able to lead that young man to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's not our theology and it's not our sermons, but it's our life. It's the transformation that Jesus Christ made in all of our lives. And if we just live that out, people will see the difference. They'll want it. And when we share the gospel, they'll gladly receive it. Perhaps we've been saved so long we forget how people live without Christ. But it's not a pretty picture. I want to close with one last illustration. I, many years ago, had the opportunity to have somebody that I greatly admired in the 70s especially. I was in high school. And I got a hold of a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And it was written by Josh McDowell. And uh, Josh McDowell was one of those first writers in, uh, in, in backing up scripture and giving arguments for faith. And uh, the whole book was just totally uh, footnoted and documented. And he's the one that figured out it had to be Lord, liar, or lunatic. I've read many of his books. Several years ago, I, I, I got a note and I found out that he is uh, going around speaking in different churches and that if you invite him, you might have an opportunity to do that. So I called up and I said, hey, uh, what would it take? I, that was one of my childhood heroes. You know, he was such a powerful writer. And uh, they said, oh, well, he could come for X amount of $1,000. And I said, uh, I'm sorry, no, 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 can't do that. They called up a week later and said, you know, Josh is speaking on a Saturday in Portland. And probably for just a love offering, he could speak at your church on Sunday. I said, now that we can do. And so that... Sunday morning, I went on the west side of Portland. I picked him up and drove him over to the southeast side where our church is. And I got to sit and talk with him while he ate his breakfast. And he told me some things about his life that he just recently started sharing the tragedy of his early years. That Sunday morning, he gave his testimony in the Sunday school hour. We had a combined Sunday school hour. And he gave his testimony. And it, and it probably shocked all of us. He said, I was raised in a very abusive family. Very abusive. He said, every single week of my life, my father would beat up my mother. He said, even as a young child, I remember my mother, mother having blood on her. As a young man, I remember when I was a junior age boy coming home and sometimes seeing my mother just passed out in a heap and there's blood all over her. Sometimes where my father would have taken a belt and whipped my mother. He said, I cannot explain it, but I had such hatred for that man. I hated him. He said, here I was a little boy and I'd go to bed and you know what my dreams were? My dreams were how to kill my father and get away with it. That was the dreams. I dreamed of the day that I would have gotten big enough that I could personally grab him around the neck and choke the life out of him. I hate it. I hate it. My father. He was such a wicked, wicked man. He said, finally, my mother died. And not because she was sick, not because she had anything, but she just gave up. She just lost the will to live. And she shriveled up and died. 
and I hated him all the more. And I couldn't wait till I got away. And finally he did. And he went to the university, and here he has all this hatred. Hatred for God, hatred for his dad, just hatred. And one day he was going by campus, and there was a group of students. They were gathered around a table, and they had open Bibles. And he thought, the fools! Why are they studying a book of make-believe stuff? Don't they know that God isn't going to help them? That's how he felt about Christianity. Finally, about three weeks later, he was going through and he met a pretty young lady and he thought, well, I'll ask her maybe for a date. And he did. And she said, well, how about a Bible study? And he says, what? You're not one of those Bible people. She said, yes, I am. How could you be so foolish? You're at a university. How can you be so foolish to believe that stuff? She said, have you ever checked out the evidence? Evidence? What are you talking about? Evidence. She said, you ought to study it out for yourself. And so finally, when it got time, he graduated. And when he went into his master's program, he thought he'd write his thesis on disproving God. And I had an opportunity to go to Europe and go to some of the old libraries. And while I was researching, I was researching on why Jesus did not rise from the dead. Why it's the biggest hoax of history, the resurrection of Christ. He said, I still remember the library I was in. And I shut the reference book and I said, it's all true. It's all true. He is the Son of God. He did rise from the grave. He said, but I didn't become a Christian. Because I knew this about Christians. If I became one, I couldn't hate my father. And I hated my father. And I knew if I became a Christian, I couldn't hate so it went six weeks like that under terrible conviction. And finally, six weeks later, one day, he just threw up his arms and said, I give up, Jesus. I give up. And I trust you as my personal Lord and Savior. And that's how he got saved. He said, I want to tell you, I didn't get saved because of all the research I did. I got saved because there was a young lady I couldn't explain. She lived a life I could not explain. The research just affirmed the life she lived. Two weeks later, he found out his father was in the hospital, so he goes to the hospital. He knocks on the door, his father says, come in. He opens the door and his father looks at him, what are you on? He walks over to him. He puts out his hand and takes his father's hand. He said, Dad, I've become a Christian. And I want you to know I love you. I love you. And I forgive you. His father instantly started bawling. And when he stopped bawling for a while, he said, Son, if Jesus can cause you to love a man as wicked as I am, I want what you have. And right there, he led his first soul to Christ, his own dad. He said, if there ever was a conversion that was like flipping a switch, like the Saul of, Saul of Tarsus and Paul the Apostle, his dramatic salvation experience, he said, it was my dad. He went from being the most wicked man on planet Earth to the most spiritual man on his love for Jesus, his love for the Word of God, his love for prayer, his love for church. He just changed in an instant of his salvation. But it never would have happened 
without a young lady who lived her faith, who influenced Josh, and without Josh being able to go to a very hateful man and say, Dad, I love you and I forgive you because of Jesus Christ. Now, all of us know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, I'm just assuming, on a Wednesday night. If you don't, I hope you will. But every one of us have an opportunity to use what God's done in our life to influence somebody else. And they're all around us, using our influence for Christ. Let's let it count for Christ. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.